Good morning, everybody. This is Patrick Lee, and it's time for Midweek Motivation Live. Special guest in the studio today, my buddy, a long time, uh, long time viewer of the show, Ross Daigle. We're going to talk about him and his life, a little bit of learning to thrive in a niche, 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 and uh, everything else that we've got, he's got going on in life. We'll be back right after this. Hey, everybody. It's Like I said, it's Midweek Motivation Live. This is your host, Patrick Lee. One of my good friends, Ross Daigle, has been a longtime listener and follower of the show, watches the show pretty faithfully. And a lot of the things after the show, many times he'll comment, has great comments on the show. Um, some of my other viewers, my sweet sister-in-law, Christine, and I were talking a while back, and she said, so many people watch the show, you should start interviewing some of the people that watch the show and get their take on the show and uh, maybe have them on as a guest and let them do a little testimonial about the show and how the show has changed things in life, you know, in their life, you know, the, the slogan of the show is motivating you to success in every area of life. In the beginning of the show, I didn't really talk about God very much. And uh, because I, this was a business show and I just wanted to motivate people and help them learn business concepts. But then some of the best things in life that, um, our business related are all Christ related as well. And we found that most motivational books in America, especially the tops of the bestseller list, all have their foundation in God's word as well. So this really became motivating you to success in every area of life, life, health, wealth, relationships, business, spirit, all combined. And Ross is a, Ross is a good example of all of those Started with nothing, been working his way up for years, and I just, you know, faithful, faithful listener to the show, and I've been talking to Ross for quite a while, wanting to get him on the show. Good morning, Sal. People already tuning in from all over to watch the show. I appreciate that. Let's get Ross back in the studio. How are you doing, Ross? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Good morning, buddy. It's good to see you. You too. Awesome. Ross Daigle. Been watching the show now almost since the beginning, right? I realized I did a couple of videos in the beginning. I hadn't even named the show yet. I just started doing a couple of videos at the uh, at the urging of my video coach at the time, who still is, who you know, my buddy Nick Krim, and said, "You need to you need to do video. The only way you're going to be successful at your age is do video. You've got to get in front of, <laughs> you've got to get in front of some people." And, and right after I started doing some videos, Ross, you started watching and tuning in every week when you can through all the changes in your life over the last couple of years. And I just I just wanted to tell you how much I appreciate that. No problem, man. I mean, I've I've always had a lot of respect for you and uh, really looked up to you uh, over the years. I mean, I think I was thinking back. I think I met you back in like, what, 2006, 2007. Yeah, it's, it's been a while. Yeah, it's yeah. been been a while, and uh, you were, I'd like to say you were a snotty-nosed kid riding around on a on a broke-down motorcycle, <laughs> <laughs> but well, like how, like how things have changed, right? Yeah, well, you know what I lacked in experience, I made up for in confidence, so. <laughs> that's it, well, that's what I like about you, man, you believe that you're going to succeed no matter what you're doing, and that, I've seen you go through some incredible cool things in your life and and uh, some of the things that that have also been very hard for you as and you've shared some of those things with me and and I've gone through some of those experiences as well um you know we've both lost important people in our lives um that helped shape who we were and we're going to talk about that a little bit in the show um we're going to jump into you know give me a little bit of of uh of life history on you recently right now you're living in Colorado right yep so family info yeah so uh my wife uh, my wife and I are a few months away from our tenth wedding anniversary congratulations uh, thank you 
yeah. we moved we moved to Colorado whenever I decided to chase my dream of working on motorcycles. I took an apprenticeship, which turned later into uh, just a full time uh, gig at NRHS V Twin Performance in Berthoud, and I uh, I was doing IT before that at Skilled Trades Company um, there in Amarillo, and uh, anyway, so I, I worked at NRHS for a while, and then when we decided we wanted to move closer to family because uh, that was we were staying in Longmont, which is quite a bit up north. Oh yeah, and so it was eight hours or so to, to Amarillo. So we wanted to move closer to family and. We had an opportunity to move to Fountain, here where my in-laws are at. And so uh, we came down here, and I took a position at Pikes Peak Harley-Davidson as a as a service tech over there. And I did that for just one season before I actually left uh, on my birthday, which was the day my wife went to labor. Yeah. Wow. So, How incredible is that? Yeah. So, uh, And that was the day that I started my business. So uh, it started as uh, – Daigle performance and then it became Pegasus performance and it's going to evolve further beyond that because now I'm doing a lot more automotive stuff. Pegasus was specifically about Buells, which is what my, my primary focus and expertise is in about the niche. But I, I told it's like, I love dead brands. So <laughs> I love dead brands. Well, the, the lack of, you know, availability or scarcity generally causes something like that to grow in desirability, of course, right? The, the, the oh, absolutely. supply and demand um, effect definitely affects that. So you worked on Harleys. The, one of the stories I remember, of course, was was the uh, story of you um, falling in love with Buells, working on a, on a broke down Buell that you started putting together in parts. And then you went all the way up to the top of the country to pick one up and rode it home. Basically, sight unseen. You, know, you had some pictures online, and uh, yeah. tell us a little bit about that, real quick. Yeah, so uh, I was going to victory with you whenever I bought my first Buell. Um, right. I bought. Uh, I was on Bad Weather Bikers, which it was a forum. It's like I know nobody talks about those anymore, but um, this ad had popped up. I had been looking for a while because I had the I had the Sportster that I was building, and really I was built. I was building into what I should have done was just fix it and buy a bought a Buell. So I ended up finding this uh, S2 that had all the stuff I wanted. It had all the it had all the touring equipment, the bags and everything, and it was in Detroit, Michigan. And uh, I I found the ad nine minutes after it was posted. And I was like, I want it. And I so I messaged him. And he sent me his phone number, and we we talked for probably four hours on the phone. So even though I only saw three pictures of it, like he held it for me for a month so I could gather up the cash. I gave him full asking and he was super cool about it. He put me up in his spare room for the night. He picked me up from the airport. I'd set up on the forums to stay at another place at another guy's house uh, on the way through. And then I stayed at my buddy's house in Weatherford the second day. But I did 730 miles first day, 690 miles the second day. And then I stayed in Oklahoma for a couple of days before I came home. I remember that. That's incredible. And it wasn't just all sunshine and roses on the way home. <laughs> no. Yeah. It's, no. Uh, it's other trip. I, it was. Uh, it was quite an experience. And I, I've done yeah. a couple since then, but um, but that was definitely the most intriguing and exciting because it. You know, the, the second one I did was a brand new bike. I was like, yeah. this one was a 20 year old bike at the time that I saw three pictures of. Didn't really know a whole lot about it. The, it had bicycle grips over the handlebars that were, they were so thin that, dude, when I got home, my fingertips were numb. And then because I was riding it every day, my fingertips stayed numb for about four months. Oh, my goodness. I could it's not do part of, part, Probably part of the reason I have carpal tunnel right now. <laughs> you think that could have something to do with it? <laughs> Throughout the course of all of that riding mules that really we're, we're going to go into this topic of self-discovery that's where you really learned that you sort of had a passion for working on these bikes they were not as common they sort of had a little resurgence a few years ago right um, yeah but they're, they're they are kind of a dead brand um but there is there is a it's a niche now right Buell riders Buell enthusiasts that's it's a niche of a specialist a person kind of like yourself that really yeah, that's what they wanted. That's what they want to ride. That's what they want to work on. 
Um, but there is a limited amount of parts, a limited amount of people that know how to work on them. And you kind of took that niche and and learned that this passion and drive that you had could make you money, correct? Yeah. So there's actually a company now that actually um, got the Buell name and they're, com- they're coming out with new bikes they call Buell, which is b- vaguely based on a- Eric Buell's, le- one of his later bikes, the EBR, but it's it's not related to the stuff that I work on because they don't make they don't supply parts for them and stuff like that. But um, but yeah, so I mean, it's it's become an incredible passion and interest for me because I have um, I have a photographic nearly eidetic memory, and running the forums for years and learn, picking up like every bit of detail that I could, and then the biggest deal for me was getting my hands on everything. And so that's that's why I've I've traveled the country to go and get bikes and parts, and like not just the bikes, but every type of aftermarket part I could find, all these other things. And I've really built this incredible network in my brain of where parts and where people have hordes that are coming off them and stuff like that. Most a lot of the parts supplies that I've bought over time have been from people that I've known for 15 years or so that, you know, they aged out. They just couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. Um, that makes perfect sense. And I'm about to I'm about to pick up two bikes later this week. I'm actually told you I'm trading my car for yeah. something less than two bikes. And that's gonna be number forty eight and number forty nine for me. Oh for my me. gosh. <laughs> that's a lot of bikes, my friend. That's a lot of bikes. Throughout this journey of growing you know, growing this passion and drive to do these things, you know, for the last couple of years, you've sent me photos of different bikes you've picked up, you've sent me photos and we've talked about different vehicles that you have picked up. Some vehicles just to flip to pay the bills. You know what I mean? Some vehicles that you really want to do some work on and maybe fix them up a little bit and some that you want to keep. But most of the time, you know, if whenever we get on the phone and talk, it's like we're going to talk for five minutes. It turns into an hour and we can talk. Yeah, right. We can talk for ages and ages because you are so passionate about the things that you do and you have such a varied past like I do and a lot of things in our lives, you know, things that are similar. We, and I, you know, in the real estate world where I'm at now, I'll have people that I'll run into at church or in town and say, man, I bought a house or I sold a house. And, and I'm like, Hey, I was a realtor and, you know, and they're like, you know, uh, you know, we, but you only deal in, you know, million dollar houses. You're a hot shot realtor. I didn't, you wouldn't be interested in that little deal that I do. And I'm, and then I have to remind people I came from nothing, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? I came from nothing. Five kids, dirt poor, mom and dad working two and three jobs each just to feed us back in the sixties and seventies um, with no formal education. And I don't just sell million. I sell some million dollar houses. Hallelujah. That's great. But I sell a majority of homes in the 100 to $200,000 price range where most people are. We're yeah. not, we're not on the internet today telling everyone that we're rich and famous. We're on the internet telling everyone that you can come from behind. You can have success in life. You can develop your passion and your motivation and go after the things in life that you want to do and, and learn to create a, a business with that. And you can meet your needs. You can give to others and be successful doing that. And that's one of the things about you that, that always really tripped my trigger that really, um, you know, it's kept us in connection because we start talking and we start sharing these stories. One of the things that you shared with me last week when we were talking was this one specific topic I want to dive into real quick. And that's called running towards fear. And when you said that, I went, whoa, that's that's kind of a... Counterculture. Yeah, it's the opposite of what most people would do. And when you experience fear, of course, big, tough guy, you're a biker, hard weather guy, but you, you come across things in life sometimes that terrify you, right? Or yeah. you're afraid of the future, right? And yeah, you know, I've yeah. I've had threats, I've had threats in my life before. You yeah, know, I've been there, but um, threatened to take your life. Yeah, yeah, but no, it's you know, it just you know, for me, there's 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 lots of there's lots of different facets that it could be that that statement could be applied to, and it should be because 
when you know as as Christians, we believe that uh, when we uh, when we focus on Christ, uh, He is our protector and He is our He has our back covered. You know, I can do all things when I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, Amen. Keep that in mind, and in his, in our weakness, He is made strong. So, just taking those things and applying them to things like, especially for me, my passion is in the niche brand because I like. I like to showcase individuality and showcase uniqueness. And so many times, I mean, just because, I mean, I have the experience, I, I have experience in knowing what it's like to um, want, like want to try and see a vision through and then not have the time to be able to go back and fix it and post. Right. Like most, most niche brands fail because their dream was bigger than, than the ability because they didn't have enough to get done. But the, the greatness is that they got done. You know, yep. Buell was, uh, Buell had this in, uh, incredible vision. I mean, he had a bike hanging in his rafters for 20 years that he had been trying to get Harley to let him make. And that was what eventually became the 1125 and then later the 1190 RX uh, or RXSX, whatever. But but whenever, whenever you have a brand like that, where I come in with the niche brand, it's like I can come in and – focus on like, what are the, what are the shortfalls and how can I fix that? You know, because I have, like I said, I have, a, I have an eidetic memory or nearly eidetic memory. So I keep track of all the failures. I keep track of all the things that, that could be a problem point and how to fix that sure. and, and how to, how to find ways to resolve that. And because usually once a few things are resolved, they become incredibly reliable machines. I mean, I've had several machines that were over 70,000 miles and I've known people that have, over a hundred thousand miles in the Buells and on the Sportsters that the Buell is based on, one of my friends has over three hundred thousand miles on his bike. That's incredible. <laughs> Absolutely. So when you come across these obstacles, what other you know, you've given us some scripture, that's good. Uh, people are afraid of of jumping into some of these things, but but there's something in you that causes you to run towards that instead of away from that. Is that something from your past? Is there, you know, is there a resource that you have inside of you that you pull on? How was that sort of developed in Ross Daigle to just go full, full head, you know, head on into whatever it is that someone else may be afraid of? You know, I don't, I don't necessarily know how to describe it, but I would say that it stems from understanding problem solving and also under, understanding that. There's no problem too big. There's just problems that seem too scary. And it's like once you break it down, you know, just like a motorcycle, it seems like a bunch of scary parts. But if you do it one step at a time, it's not a big deal. And I'm losing track here. That's but a, Okay. Were you born with this ability or was this developed somewhere else? I, I would say I would say uh, it's. I would say that some of it was born and a lot of it was just taking advantage of the talents that I was given. Right. Um, you know, I think that, I think that I have, I was given a certain knack, but it, it took a lot of years of sculpting and molding to develop that into the talent that I have to yeah. get the return on stuff that I do now. Um, and sense. I credit a lot of that. You know, I think I told you a story about my dad. Uh, he was a roofer for 27 years. He, he had, I mean, he had skin cancer all over his body and stuff, uh, which was funny. Like that really didn't that didn't have any effect on what did him in. But um, he always told me to use to work with my head and not with my hands. Yeah. And there's only two jobs that I ever had that were extremely physical labor. And one of them, you know, uh, are you well aware of us affiliated foods? <laughs> but there's only ever two. Yeah, there was only ever two jobs that I was fired from. It wasn't because I wasn't any good at it. It was just because like for whatever outside sources were yeah. um, and both of them were physical jobs and every other job I've excelled and, and exceeded. I guess you could say that, that uh, waiting tables was physical, but that's not really the focus. Not, not really. Yeah. We try to tell everybody, especially our kids and people that were training work smarter, not harder. Yeah. It's, it's always that concept work smarter, not harder. I weighed, about 125 pounds when I married my wife 32 years ago and became a baker 
and the, everything in the bakery was a 50 pound bag of sugar, a 50 pound bag of flour, a hundred, yeah. uh, you know, bag of flour or cake mix or everything on our trucks that we unloaded was a 50 pound block of shortening, a 50 pound bucket of icing. Um, you know, everything was 50 pounds and up and most of them were a hundred pounds and up. They weighed nearly as much as I did, but because I was small, I would always try to outwork everybody. I was a wrestler in high school and I wrestled my freshman year, 93 pounds. So I was a little guy, right? So yeah. always felt I had to work harder to keep up with the bigger guys. Although all of the seasoned people who came before me would tell me, work smarter, not harder, Patrick. Your body's going to regret it when you get older if you don't quit working so hard with your body. And you took that, you know, your dad worked with the sweat of his brow and his hands roofing with hard labor. Man, that's hard work. I, I did it every summer with him for yeah. 12 years. But, yeah. you know, uh, I'm getting back to what we were talking about. With running towards fear, I think a lot of it, a lot of it is, is just basically – recognizing and, and, and interpreting uh, or interpreting and trying to weaponize scripture to my benefit because um i, I lost all that that's well, okay <laughs> and you hear i'm not even a professional speaker and neither are you it's okay yeah. right? but um friends but here. yeah but what i said part of that is what i said before, what i mentioned to you last week was you just gotta not be afraid to suck it's like everybody sucks at something when they start at it it's like you when you started something, you're graded at your potential. You're not graded at what you do. And so when you become when you grow older and you're graded on what you do, you become fearful of doing stuff that doesn't work. And you have to you have to overcome that and you have to be able to just understand that every every investment in myself that I put into the time to figure this out gives me more skills and more facets. And then also understanding that because I'm a child of God, like I I am enough as I am. And yes. I, I build this for for personal fulfillment. I don't build this for anybody else or to make my value to anybody else. I build it for my own benefit and for my own value. So I always want to invest in myself rather than whenever I can instead of investing in other people. I mean, I do want to invest. I do want to invest in other people, but I don't I want I want to learn how to do something for myself. Uh, as much as possible so that I can have that skill whenever I need it, whenever there's nobody else that I can depend on to, to be there. Absolutely. Ab <laughs> absolutely. We say that a lot about God, right? Put God in you when you feel like you don't need him. So he's going to be what comes out when you do need him, right? Yeah. The scripture itself when you don't need it. Uh, so a lot of these concepts run consistently through time and through business and life, which is that's like literally so a lot of the things that I like about you running towards fear is of course is great. Not being afraid to, I, I put created the banner on the screen there. Don't be afraid to suck at something. You know what I mean? And it's a, it's true. Uh, everyone thinks we have this preconceived notion or this notion um, that's, that's thrust upon us by society that before we present anything to the world, we have to be perfect at it. And that's simply not true. The most, um, most organic social media content is uh, the, the content that moves the furthest. The people that are not afraid to show their failures, their weaknesses, um, that suck at some things, when they show that to people, that actually causes you to be lifted higher in their eyes because of your, your vulnerability. Absolutely. You, right? Yeah. So I actually follow uh, a vocal coach on YouTube. And one of the things that she mentions is how there's certain songs and certain scenarios where actually being off pitch or having these cracks in your voice actually create a vulnerability and get the message across better than having a perfect message. And especially growing from a niche, like understanding that the vision is often greater than the, what you, what you have to fix yeah. and post. It's like, you, 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 uh, people aren't interested in polish. People are interested in your passion and in your, in your drive. So uh, the best, the most that you can do to, 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 uh, communicate that and share that with them is what is how you will best grow. Man. I love that. 
You're dropping, <laughs> dropping bombs here, Ross. You don't even know it. You're dropping bombs that people need to hear. And these and, and these things get lost in a regular conversation online. These things get lost. So over the last year specifically, I've learned to watch how other shows, other podcasts, how they interview people. And it's changed the way I interview people. And it's caused me to learn to listen for the message in between what someone says. And the message doesn't have to be polished. And it actually the vulnerability that's in there and the brokenness is what gets people's attention. And then you slip something in there. This one, don't be afraid to suck at something is is huge. Running towards fear is is huge. Um, your passion and your drive will carry you when your ability doesn't. That's huge. And these are these are things that we teach on the show. And of course, I have to, you know, I'm I'm bringing it back to that because the show's about you. And this is the reason we interviewed you because I, you know, we've shared so much through the years. I'd like to think that we've had a little bit of a of an impact on helping you develop some of oh, these absolutely. things. Your life. And I absolutely. love that. The, the thing that I want to touch on here last, we're, we're nearly out of time, but we, <laughs> yeah, have, sorry. we have a few minutes to dive into this and that's overcoming adversity. You're afraid we're going to talk about this. I told you we were <laughs> over, overcoming adversity, which is ADHD through accountability. Accountability I talk about on the show a lot. Um, how to solve problems that, that you have used. Uh, many times, you know, write down the pros and cons on a piece of paper, put a line down the middle, um, create a schedule, have an accountability partner. All of these things are concepts. And this particular one seems to be one that you have battled and have learned that through accountability, you can overcome a lot of these things. So let's talk about that just a little bit about how old were you when um it was determined that, that that was something that you battled was ADHD. So I've pretty much known about it my whole life, but it wasn't until I want to say three, maybe three or four years ago that I, I was actually diagnosed by my doctor. And one of the biggest things that she mentioned is because we, we experimented a little bit. We tried some different, uh, some different medication, but um, the biggest, the biggest thing that she mentioned that I took to heart and recognized what, and I recognized immediately that it was true because of my experiences um, in my in the workforce. But she said that having having counseling and accountability are far greater impact than the medication, which proves why it's I think that it's underdiagnosed. And I think it's uh, oversimplified and it's over fear, you know, running right. towards that fear. There, there's great advantages to a lot of ADHD because uh, a lot of things about ADHD. Uh, and then there's great downfalls, but the, the the key is to find ways to maximize the advantages and minimize the downfalls so that you can overcome it. And uh, but she said that, like I said, counseling and accountability. You know, my my business it grew like a wildfire, but I'm just one person, and it became quickly where I was as a service say in the weeds, and and that's where we developed a lot of problems, and especially in my marriage and stuff, and. And we, it took some time to talk through that. And it wasn't until uh, I brought my wife in to help her or have her help me hold accountable and really push me to get stuff done and to focus on things that, that my business has really grown a lot, a lot more naturally and a lot more organically now and has given me the opportunity to expand into doing a lot more automotive, uh, a lot more skill sets and tooling and everything else like i've been able to really grow it in ways that i couldn't do before that is incredible it really is so just and we one of the disabilities we talked or some of the things people battle we've talked about on the show and adhd actually isn't one of them that we've talked about much we've talked about depression battling depression i've let people know of, of, we've talked about abuse of many different kinds and my recommendation will always be um, number one, pray about it, get a prayer partner about it because the prayer the power of two people praying for your situation is incredibly powerful, but get help. I'll always tell somebody seek professional help. Um, realtors are called upon usually to be marriage counselors, bartenders, parental guidance counselors, um, a, you know, a shoulder to cry on a listening ear. Yeah. 
we do it all, but I am not a professional in all of those things. I'm a professional friend. I'm a professional at helping people buy and sell homes. Don't, don't get me wrong, but I am not an, an emotional counselor. I'm not a, 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 you know, a professional counselor in these areas. And I recommend everyone get help, but I also recommend everyone have someone to hold them accountable. Accountability. When you, um, start a new job it's we're accountable to to cause people to you know you call them and say hey are you coming in today sometimes if someone's having a problem and they're not making it in we need to call them and say hey how are you doing if we miss somebody hey where are you today what's going on we haven't heard from somebody in a few days how are you doing are you still holding up your side of whatever we agreed to and i counsel i do counsel a lot of people and, but that's key, what you just said, bringing her in to hold you accountable um, helps you control the squirrel mode, right? Yeah. I can ch- you can chase a million things in a day and not get anything done. Of yeah. course, so, are you a big list maker now? Have you started writing everything down that you need to get done? Yeah, that, I, I, do have to, I do have to make lists. Uh, one of the other things I did want to touch on that, um, that a lot of people don't realize that ADHD um, – most times also comes with bad anxiety and uh-huh. because of, because of the squirrel mode and the anxiety of not knowing like, what do I do? Should I do want to do? Do I want to do something that I should do? Or do I want to do something that I want to do? It's like, it's, uh, and then feeling guilt about any of those modes and not, and just not really knowing where to focus. It, it creates, it creates a situation where you often get nothing done. And yeah. so there's, uh, having accountability, having a list and having, you know, so, uh, sometimes being able to break it down and be like, Hey, you know, this is what I need to get done in this next 30 minutes. And then I'll make a check mark and I'll make a, uh, if I need to make a contact, say, Hey, I got this done today. Just have, or say, Hey, will you hit me up in 30 minutes so that I can make, make sure that I'm on task. Like just trying to find a way to help keep you on task. I mean, there's different methods that work for different people, but, but yeah. staying on task is really key. And then also, um, like you mentioned about having a, a professional, uh, I think having somebody on the outside looking in is incredibly beneficial and, and useful. I, um, and I think that it, it's for a lot of times it's really necessary. Um, I did want to touch that, you know, like you said, even though you're not a professional, it's like just like I said about vulnerability. It's like people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So right. it's like it's uh, you really uh, want to focus on building relationships so that you can have somebody that wants to hold you accountable. 100% brother. That's, that's the ongoing theme throughout midweek motivation live. You know what I say it every week. Uh, it's all about people. Everything in life comes down to relationships and in your spiritual life in your personal life and your business life, social life, it's all about relationships. And you have shared a lot of things. You've sort of opened up your soul and shared a lot of things in life that have happened to you and how you've overcome it. I think that that uh, accountability and relationships um, has really helped you to not just be an over-medicated person, right? You could just take pills and say, "I just this is what this is this is what I'm diagnosed with. This is my lot in life. I'll just take my drugs and uh, and and just take whatever life hands me." But yeah. you decided. No, I'm not going to accept that. I can, you know, through the power of God and relationships, I can overcome this 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 adversity in my life. Not Absolutely. Really that. Let me give you an example of that. You know, I felt there was a time last year that I felt like the medication that I was on was waning or not having as much of an effect. And then, my, then, then I got an accident. My dad passed. My brother got in an accident. There was so much going on that. My medication lapsed. I, I still haven't gone back to medication. I, I've been without medication for about eight months, but I still have to hold myself accountable and keep working and do all these other things uh, because I wanted to get to I wanted to get to a level position. Uh, I didn't want all of the emotions and other stuff to impact what I was saying because I didn't want to just blindly take medication. I'm I'm not anti medication, but I'm very conservative on medication. I would rather find a new level of peace before I tried to get onto an anxi- another anxiety or ADHD medication, man. I just want to tell you, I'm proud of you. Uh, 
I'm so glad you're my friend. Thank you for agreeing to come on the show today. I know this was a stretch for you. You're a mechanic. You're not, <laughs> you're not a speaker, but you got things across, and that's what that's what mattered today. I wanted people to hear, you know, these these underlying themes through your life and how this how you get through life, and and a lot of the the concepts that you share were just what people needed to hear today. And my my main motto at the end of this, I say a lot of times at the end of the show applies 100% to you today. Courage begins at the end of your comfort zone. Yeah. Right? Well, you know, the Bible says that you don't put new wine in old wine skins, you don't put old wine in old wine skins. Like you have you have to be continually renewing yourself and renewing your mind so that you can be continually ready for growth. That's it. hundred percent, my friend. It's been a great show. I appreciate you coming on today, Ross. We'll talk to you again soon, buddy. You guys, uh, everyone has been Patrick Lee with Midweek Motivation Live. You know that we do this as a service to you. If you know anyone looking to buy, sell, or invest in real estate, have them click on the link to my digital business card in the comments below this video, www.patricklee.work. If you know anyone that owns a Buell motorcycle or would be interested in talking to my buddy Ross, you can simply hit me up a message and I will get you in touch with Ross. If you're looking for parts, custom work on older Buells, the, the early model Buells, Ross is your guy. And he's yeah, not well, really anything through 2014. So. Yeah, anything pre-2014. Awesome. Ross, have a great day, my friend. I'll talk to you All soon. Right. You too, brother. Bye.